Okay, it's always good to be home, um, and I feel like being at home. Um, during the conferences like this one, I met, um, I'm at Jolodu, and here I am <laughs> together with Jolodu, and, uh, um, and uh, some of my really eminent colleagues um, having the honor to uh, discuss my recent research. Uh, I am very adapted to, um, to Michał Heller. Um, he's kind of an amazing feature, being so successful in his uh, own field or fields. It's just not in one field, but uh, he's just curious and open about other fields. And, uh, and he actually knows a lot about other fields. I don't know how he does it, but, uh, but he does it. Uh, I will be discussing research uh, um, that I conducted uh, in Regina Sullivan's lab together with Regina, who's been a wonderful mentor to me, and uh, uh, I will have a chance to uh, probably later to uh, emphasize more um, her impact on my work. So thank you. Thank you, um, my mentors, for making it possible uh, that uh, I'll be giving this talk here. And there's kind of a one, one suggestion to the youngest generation of, uh, of participants. Uh, really take advantage that uh, you have great people here. Talk to them, make them emotional. Uh, I don't know, take Joe Ledoux to the pub, give him a guitar, uh, make him sing uh, and, uh, and play. Corner Yadin to die, um, study his emotions to um, unemotional questions or unemotional uh, or uh, information. Just take advantage, really. It's, it's great to, to, um, to talk to um, researchers uh, also on this personal level. They're usually interesting people. Mm. So, when you're talking about um, Neuroscience and research in neuroscience, there are um, levels of organization that we study in neuroscience. Which one I should put here? So we have the, the level, the social level, the, the level of an individual, systems level when we study brain circuits, several level, and, um, and the genetic level. And very often, um, you know, there is a lot of confusion in the perception of science. Like if we um, talk about the, an individual that is fearful or scared, then you may um, open a newspaper and see, oh, the brain is afraid, or oh, the scientists or researchers, uh, somewhere they discovered how the brain lies. Well, the brain doesn't lie, but uh, it does not mean that we cannot study lying in the brain. Uh, so it's very important to kind of to be aware of these uh, levels of explanation, because uh, th these levels of studies are also levels of explanations in a way. And uh, very often, um, and you ha you already had some examples, and you have more examples uh, in our studies, kind of confined to maybe two or three levels. Uh, sometimes it's uh, studying, let's say, social emotions in an individual using brain imaging, so you have the systems level when you're studying the circuits, or, um, or we may skip some levels, so we study, um, let's say, um, emotions uh, uh, and, uh, and genes that uh, somehow correlate with, uh, with, uh, with certain emotions, or moods, or disorders. So, again, um, probably the whole uh, goal of all this effort in neuroscience is not only to characterize uh, particular levels or, or the phenomena at particular levels, but also to connect them in a, kind of a, a smart way. And uh, we're not there yet. So there will be kind of a lot of, um, there are a lot of gaps, but it's, a, it's still a very fascinating endeavor. Now, in uh, my talk, mm, I will focus on, on the social level, individual, and systems level. Um, I'll be talking about um, transfer of land fear experience across generations. And again, 
I'm a clinician, I'm a child psychiatrist. I work with uh, traumatized children, their families, but uh, um, as Regina Sullivan said, you know, there's, we are very limited in what we can do uh, research-wise uh, with, um, with human subjects, and we can actually learn a lot from animal models. So I'll be, I'll be discussing research uh, using animal models, or animal model that, uh, that Regina and I have been working on for the past uh, few years. Now, if we are talking about this uh, social level, um, that uh, neuroscience is uh, attempting to understand the phenomena, we um, kind of can characterize kind of a, lot of, um, uh, a lot of phenomena there. Uh, in the case of fear, it is quite known that uh, we can learn, um, learn to be afraid observing others. Um, Bliss Phelps uh, will be giving a talk tomorrow um, in her lab. Uh, they demonstrated that if you, um, let's say, make a subject uh, watch on a screen um, uh, someone else, let's say another subject, who kind of responds with a painful expressions on, on, uh, on her face, and this uh, person who is watching this film is instructed that, oh, this person is uh, kind of in pain because uh, they're being given an electric shock. So this person who watches this movie about the shocked uh, um, subject learns to be afraid of the stimuli that are associated with this, uh, with this shock. So we have an observational uh, ability to learn to be afraid of, of the stimuli that we know that cause harm to someone else. And this uh, has been shown um, not only in, uh, in humans, but also in other species, uh, uh, including, uh, um, I'm not sure which, which monkeys, monkeys not a species, but uh, uh, it's been shown in monkeys, also in rodents, in mice, and in rats. And we know that, um, that uh, observational learning in adults based on uh, Liz Phelps' lab work involves the circuits that are um, involving field conditioning, field learning. So when the, when the neutral stimulus is fed with, uh, with the shock or something very aversive, uh, this is kind of in brief uh, field conditioning. Joel Adu will, uh, will tell you more about that tonight. Uh, but uh, again, the conclusion is that observational learning involves the structures involved in fear conditioning. Now, little is known how mm, these processes of responding to someone else's fear, how these processes uh, um, uh, occur in uh, infancy. And we heard from, uh, from Regina that uh, infants have um, a lot of impact on us, and you know, most of us probably had an experience of, of uh, uh, being quite emotional with little children. We also learned that uh, an adult or caregiver has an impact on an infant, uh, this whole concept of social buffering. If, uh, if the mother is around, the child feels less pain. And, uh, Again, this is something that probably common sensually we are aware of or we've been aware of, but uh, uh, actually it, it was not reflected in the way we, um, we work with children. It's quite recent, maybe like the past uh, few decades when we allow and we recommend actually parents to stay with uh, the children in hospitals when, you know, when the children undergo procedures or treatment. Um, now, studying trauma in infancy is also important because um, we know that early child experiences, they affect the way we, we perceive the world, that we make our new experiences in life. And uh, the structures underlying these early um, childhood uh, experiences are somewhat different. So, let's say if... Um, um, if we um, the, take an example of, uh, of a child or, or let's say, let's stay with rats, 
of an infant rat that was traumatized a few days to, after, after birth, we know that the structures that are responsible for kind of a perception of the context or, encode, uh, or encoding of the context of trauma, these structures are not functional yet. <coughs> Hippocampus or, or more important rats uh, and humans will be hippocampus plus neocortex. So there is trauma there, there are emotional responses, but the ability to um, kind of put the trauma into context and uh, process the trauma is not there. So the early, early childhood traumas are really different than traumas that occur later in life. From the clinical perspective, we also know that uh, actual early childhood traumas are probably one of the strongest predictors of the response to, uh, to some medications, like antidepressants in, uh, in adults. So uh, again, um, the rising uh, recognition of, of studying trauma in children I think has some very uh, strong basis in clinical work, theoretical work. Now, we know um, about infants that um, they, they're emotional, they also read emotions. Um, we haven't been aware of, of, of the fact that children have, uh, experience emotions because we very often um, use uh, the paradigm that uh, um, kind of explains adult functioning to understanding children. Children are different creatures, really. They, they um, you know, process things differently. They, um, they're even emotional in a different way. Uh, the ignorance that uh, the adults or, or researchers and clinicians uh, uh, somehow um, express in, in working with children. I'll, I'll give you one example. Um, it was still maybe like 20, 30 years ago that uh, um, clinicians, doctors do not recognize that children uh, experience pain, like newborns. And, uh, and uh, many surgeries at those times were conducted without any analgesia on, on newborns. And uh, sometimes when I talk to, um, to my colleagues, uh, um, who started their careers, let's say, 30, 40 years ago, they recall examples of open heart surgeries without any analgesia in, in newborns. So, uh, again, so now when we think about that and what kind of impact these, uh, um, these events might have had on, a, on the life of a child and an adult, it's kind of horrible. Children are emotional and they are kind of more emotional than we think, but they're emotional in a different way. One of, one of the observations um, uh, of, uh, documenting that children read emotional signals and respond to them is this social uh, referencing paradigm. And uh, again, probably be the best thing if, uh, if everybody you know, refers to their own experiences, but uh, if you um, see a child, uh, let's say around a year, old uh, and, and the child was with the mother or the father, a caregiver, and someone, someone new comes, it's a stranger. The child may uh, respond in fear, some, some children are more you know, trustful, they be curious, curious. Very often, the child, before really responding or interacting with this stranger, will look at the parent. If the parent is okay, if there is a smile or, or on the parental face, then the child was smart too. So this is, uh, this is what the social uh, uh, referencing uh, uh, is about, that uh, the child uh, learns to read emotional cues from the parent in assessing the environment, especially if there is kind of a lot of ambiguity, if there's something unknown, like a stranger. And again, first uh, it was um, you know, observed in children like around a year old, but then um, then uh, researchers found that uh, it's present at 10 months, uh, but even this, this was shifted to maybe six months old, uh, old infants who were, um, the researchers were able to observe that. There are some differences actually for, for, for younger infants. Uh, it's kind of more important that the parent is there. 
than the older uh, uh, children, well, older, when I say older, I mean 10 months and older, they are more sensitive to parental emotional expressions. And the social referencing um, paradigm uh, has been also um, described uh, in primates, other primates, the humans. Now, when um, in, in Regina, Regina in her talk was talking about this kind of buffering aspect of a parent on a child, I would like to you know, look at, at another side of it. So what if the parent is stressed? What if the parent is traumatized? What kind of impact does this uh, parent uh, has on, on her children? There has been some research, uh, some animal studies of non-genetic transmission of, uh, of parental trauma. Um, uh, there are uh, kind of existing Holocaust studies that tell us about uh, uh, transmission of trauma. I will tell, uh, I'll, I'll discuss it a little bit more. But uh, in terms of the impact of um, parental trauma or, or uh, fearful situations. Uh, so this is something that's actually not uncommon in biology. Uh, it has been shown, for example, in, uh, in water flea that uh, mothers that are exposed during their pregnancy, pregnancy to chemo signals from aquatic predators, uh, their offsprings, they, um, they exhibit significantly larger helmet-like growths on their necks. So somehow they're kind of prepared to deal better with the predator or respond better to the predator. And again, it has, not, it has nothing to do with the behavior. These are you know, morphological changes. It has been also demonstrated in biology or observed that uh, um, lizards, that if female lizards are exposed to the scent of lizard eating snakes during gestation, they give birth to offspring uh, that it's more sensitive to the other of the predator. So there is, there, again, evolution uh, established some mechanisms to transfer the experience of a parent uh, on a child. Um, and when we're thinking about uh, some possible mechanism, we have uh, probably one of the best known researchers, Michael Meany, uh, you know, demonstrated how uh, abused and then also abusive mother, how they, um, how they affect their behavior. They uh, looked at um, some anxiety-like traits, so when we have an anxious mother or traumatized mother, the offspring uh, will tend to be you know, more anxious. It's, but it's non-specific anxiety, not to any particular cues. They're generally more anxious. And we also know that um, uh, there is dysregulation in this HPA axis, uh, hypothalamus, pituitary gland, uh, uh, adrenal cortex. So stress hormones the, uh, um, are not released in a way they would be released in a, an individual that is adapted to the environment. Now, I mentioned Holocaust studies. That's actually quite interesting because uh, it has been observed that uh, second generation of Holocaust survivors. So first generation are those who, ex who survived Holocaust, who, who had the personal experience of Holocaust. The second generations are the children. So they never been uh, uh, physically uh, present during the Holocaust, but they were raised by the, by the traumatized parents. And uh, what the research has shown that uh, the children of, um, of Holocaust survivors especially if these Holocaust survivors develop post-traumatic stress disorder that I will um, tell you more about, they have some symptoms of PTSD that is related to Holocaust, even if they never experienced Holocaust themselves. Now, PTSD, a post-traumatic stress disorder, is a condition that uh, occurs after emotional trauma, life-threatening event, and is characterized by cluster of symptoms, uh, so one of, uh, one of these symptoms will be avoidance. So if someone, let's say, um, if someone was um, you know, severely assaulted, um, was a life-threatening event somewhere in the park or, um, or raped, then this person may avoid going to the park, uh, even throughout the life. These, these, uh, emo these uh, emotional memories last throughout the life. So the avoidance of the cues related to, to the trauma. 
uh, another um, kind of a cluster of symptoms is the, rec uh, is the reprocessing of, uh, of the trauma. So a person who is traumatized uh, will uh, have nightmares in which these traumatic events are uh, kind of recalled. Or they will have flashbacks during the daytime when they suddenly uh, when they suddenly will kind of start behaving uh, uh, as if the trauma is, is occurring again. Um, I worked in the uh, in, um, VA Veterans Affairs Hospital with, uh, with um, U.S. Army veterans returning from, uh, from Iraq, Afghanistan, and uh, sometimes, uh, let's say, this, uh, the power of these flashbacks is so strong that, uh, that people kind of behave, they are in the ER, they are in a hospital, and they will like, behave like in, the, in the battlefield. They'll start hiding or, or some, uh, making some defensive post postures. Uh, it's, um, it, has, it may really have a very profound uh, impact on someone's life. And another um, cluster of symptoms uh, in PTSD, these symptoms are related to you know, hyperarousal. Uh, there's also uh, severe dysregulation of a, of a uh, sleep and, and other symptoms that maybe I won't discuss. Now, if this is a definition of PTSD, that they are traumatic memories, so there are all these intrusive memories, and they are related to something that someone experienced, so how is it possible that uh, a child, uh, a second generation Holocaust survivor, a child of someone who survived Holocaust, that they have intrusive memories related to Holocaust? They never, they never made uh, uh, these memories themselves I mean, as a part of their physical experience, but they actually do have these experiences. So this was something that really intrigued me, and um, uh, you know, Regina and I had a lot of conversations, you know, how is, what, what can we do to you know, better understand that uh, aspect of uh, trauma? So we, um, we designed um, kind of a protocol that we uh, call the mother to infant transfer of land fear. And I'm saying land fear is just to, to make a difference because uh, uh, there are earlier studies showing the impact of maternal trauma on, um, on uh, offsprings, like micro mini studies when you see that there's increased anxiety, general anxiety. But here we're talking about a particular experience. So the mother has a particular experience and the child will respond to cues that are related, associated with this experience. So we used a few conditioning uh, uh, protocol in which this aversive stimulus is, is paired with, uh, with neutral stimulus and we, you'll hear more about that. And uh, we fear conditioned um, female rats, they, uh, they were presented with a neutral other scent and that was paired with mild uh, electric shocks. Then these mothers were kind of uh, left for, for about, say, several weeks. And let's say after a few weeks, they were matched with, two weeks after a few conditioning, they were matched with uh, male rats. They got pregnant. Now, after the pregnancy, they delivered the pups. And in our pilot studies, we, uh, uh, we run experiments uh, when the pups were a few days old. Then later we, um, we did some more experiments with pups that were 15 uh, days old, but the results were really similar. Uh, so when uh, the pups were a few days old or 15 days old, we re-exposed the mother to this conditioning cue, to the scent, odor, that was spread with a shock before the pregnancy. And the mother was re-exposed to this uh, odor in the presence of the pups. So we kind of assumed that the mother will be afraid when, um, when she sends the, the daughter, and the pups that are with the mother somehow uh, will um, observe, perceive, or experience, probably that's the, best experience, uh, the, the, that's the best word, they will experience their maternal fear to this particular other. And now the question is whether they will uh, somehow learn anything from that. And uh, after, after this re-exposure of the mother, then we would uh, take the pups without the mother and uh, expose the pups to this cue that the mother was conditioned earlier. And then we'll, we'll, we'll see whether pups uh, respond in a fearful way to this cue. So um, 
I have an example here of, um, of a mother with her pups that, uh, let me see, okay, here. Probably need some technical, um, some technical support because I, I close that if I can ask for technical support. All right. So we have here, okay, this is the mother, there's, with the pups, there is no, there is no fear cue. What's happening here, the mother is nursing, the pups are, um, mother is not scared, pups are fine, and, and you will see what happens when the mother is exposed to the cue. I will tell you when it happens. So. The, Okay, so now the queue starts, so the, the order is delivered by tubing, see? Look at the mother. And the queue comes from, um, from the right side. There is a tubing that delivers the order. So mother is not nursing anymore. She's kind of, she's trying to bury her pups in the, hide them. And she's kind of exploring a little bit the area from, from which the, this odor comes. She's, oh, this is where, where she sniffed, this is where the, the tubing was installed. Now the mother is trying to hide herself. Now she's building a barrier between the nest and the pups and the source of another. So this is um, just an example. There are uh, you know, a lot of uh, few behaviors that you, in, uh, that you, can, uh, that you can see, uh, such as uh, freezing so, um, or immobility when the mother is scared and she wouldn't, wouldn't move at all. This, this mother was quite active. She was trying to, um, to um, I don't know, disrupt the, uh, or eliminate this uh, stimulus or, or isolate uh, herself and her pups from, from, from this uh, stimulus that uh, was associated in her memories with, uh, with danger. Now, uh, we, um, we, we took um, the pups of this mother and uh, we ran one of the tests uh, in Regina Sullivan's talk, there was something like a Y maze. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it really has a shape of a, of a, of a, um, of Y. So you, uh, you, you place the animal at one end, and there are kind of two ends. And there, on each end, there are two, two different others, and, uh, and an animal chooses where to go. If they are afraid of an other, they wouldn't go to explore the end of this Y ladder when this other is, they will go rather to the other one. So they will kind of avoid the, uh, the source of, of the fear. So we used um, Y maze test, but we also look at freezing responses and it, it really, uh, uh, these responses, uh, both these tests, uh, they showed similar results. So what we found that, uh, that pups uh, with, um, of the mothers that had this traumatic experience, they were really uh, avoiding um, exploring this uh, area of the Y, y maze when, when this order was placed. We ran some control experiments, but 
um, you know, it's important for science, just the, the message is here, these control experiments were, so when, when um, the Q was neutral, the mother was not, never, never shocked in the presence of the Q, or mother received the, the Q, was presented to this other, and received shocks during this training session, but it was not paired. And uh, we didn't see you know, any uh, avoidance of, uh, of the other. Uh, and we also looked uh, using these um, brain imaging uh, techniques that, uh, that Regina mentioned to, to DG. We, we found that um, uh, the areas that uh, are more active in PUPS during this experience, it's amygdala, which was responsible for, for field learning. It's exactly like field learning in PUPS. We also found the response in um, olfactory bulb. Olfactory bulb is involved in field learning in PUPS. And uh, actually there was no, no difference uh, um, in the activity of olfactory bulb between the PUPS that uh, received this socially, so, socially transmitted fear session uh, when they were compared to the PUPS that were just fear conditioned. But we, uh, we observed a difference in, in activity of uh, accessory olfactory bulb. So there was more activity in the accessory olfactory bulb in the PAPs that were re-exposed with the traumatized mother, which is interesting because accessory olf olfactory bulb is involved in, um, let's say, uh, in social behaviors, in, um, uh, in detection and responses to pheromones, for example. It's also involved in... Um, in uh, responses in alert signaling. So if there's something really, uh, uh, that causes an animal to be alert, that there will be increased of response in uh, accessory olfactory bulb. Now, pups that, uh, um, that we studied, especially if they were a few days old, they, um, they don't see, their eyes are closed, they can hear, they can smell, but they don't see. So is there an observ observational learning here? What will they observe if they, if they don't, uh, if they don't uh, see anything? Um, but they respond somehow. So we, we wanted to kind of find a more mechanistic explanation. So what is that makes them uh, to be afraid? Well, they can hear, that's, that's, that's true. Um, well, there was a hint in the structures that are involved in, um, in olfaction, like, uh, olfactory bulb, accessory olfactory bulb, these structures were more activated. Uh, so we um, kind of designed another experiment in which we, um, during the re-exposure of a traumatized mother, we kept the mother separated from the pups. The mother was in a jar, um, and uh, the pups were in, the, in another jar. So when the cue was delivered, uh, through the tubing to the, to the mother, and then the air from the jar when the mother was, was pushed to the jar when the pups were. And uh, this was, there was kind of an acoustic isolation. We checked that there were no sounds coming out of these jars. So what was happening that when, when the cue was presented, uh, the pups were not, were not with, physically with the mom, but they were getting the smell of the scared mom. And then we tested these pups, and what we observed was that these pups were actually um, uh, afraid. So it was enough for the pups to smell the scent of the fearful mom to, uh, uh, to learn that uh, this cue that was delivered um, through the additional tubing, that this cue uh, predicts uh, danger. Again, uh, uh, there is a really in increasing interest in the, in the role of uh, olfactory system in, in humans, especially in a clinical setting. Um, for sure, infants probably make, humor infants make more use of it than adults, but uh, we do not know uh, whether this, uh, this is the mechanism that will underlie uh, this type of learning in humans. Now, so this was kind of an example how, you know, how uh, in neuroscience we are trying to translate some problems that we see in humans to translate them into the lab setting, uh, but then we have to kind of bring it back and say, you know, what, uh, um, what, what can we make of these studies? Well, 
For developmental neuroscience, it's actually uh, it's important to, um, uh, to learn how this type of learning relates to other forms of learning. Because it looks like that emerges very early. So there, it, it, it's kind of a hint uh, about the evolutionary significance uh, of um, this uh, uh, form of learning. Uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, this form of learning um, occurs or is present when the structures that are responsible for a, kind of a better analysis of, of the context or analysis of the context perception, uh, they're not functional yet, like hippocampus. Um, even if there are, there are differences between rodents and humans, uh, actually the logic of the development of the neural system is the same. So we have uh, uh, we are born with uh, highly functional, a fully functional amygdala, but the hippocampus is fully functional at the age of three. So, uh, so let's say one-year-old, two-year-old, they made traumatic memories, but, they, but they're not explicit. They, you will see them in the behaviors, in the responses to, to cues related to trauma, but uh, they will not tell you about that. Maybe later on they will try to tell something, but these words are disconnected because they were never connected at the first place. Or, so clinically, it's important uh, what kind of work, uh, what, what shall we do uh, working with, uh, uh, with victims of early childhood abuse. And we hope that by studying these phenomena in animals, we can, um, we can learn more about that. There are some implications in the social realm. Uh, and our inspiration came from observations of this phenomenon in humans. And, and to Holocaust studies. You know that uh, memories are um, um, part of our identity, or maybe there will be no identity uh, without memories. Here we have memories of our ancestors that are being kind of transferred from generation to generation. Um, people, clinicians who work with families, they will see that there are lots of, um, let's say, implicit, um, never verbally expressed behaviors in the family that uh, uh, are related to traumas that occurred generations earlier. People kind of might be more sensitive to some, uh, to some events, like to war, if someone died in a war, to some accidents. It's kind of passed from generation to generation. Now, there are some implications for, um, let's say, a legal system, because if, uh, if, um, if we know that trauma is transferred from generation to generation and uh, and someone is you know, getting some compensations for, for their trauma. So what about the children? If, they, um, if the impact of the trauma uh, uh, exceeds uh, one generation. So these are the thoughts that uh, I would like to finish my talks and uh, be more than happy to answer um, or take any questions. I'm not sure why I have answers for, for uh, all of your questions. And again, I would like to um, um, say thank you to Regina, who, um, who is a great uh, really mentor and collaborator. It's fun to, to do experiments together. She has a lot of kind of a um, joy of a child when running experiments. So, and uh, and here, are, here is the team from Regina's lab, with people who are especially helpful, but I like to acknowledge others too. And, uh, uh, also, thank you for video editing to, to Tris, who is Regina's daughter. And uh, again, thank you to Joe, because Joe brought me to neuroscience, and uh, um, you know, if, uh, has a, had the greatest impact on, on the way I, um, I think as a neuroscientist. And thank you, Michal, for... Uh, for everything that was before my, my adventure with neuroscience and that's, that, that happened since then and that, that, that will happen. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much and still we have uh, several minutes uh, to ask questions and to discussion to both lecturers. Professor Dutai. Regina, it's for you. What happens to an, for you later, <laughs> what, what happens to anosmic children? Uh, I'm sorry? Anosmic children, would they form attachment in anosmic mothers? Humans. Humans. Yeah.
So I'm just saying that uh, human children, when they're born, have many sensory systems that they use to interact with their caregiver. A rat is more limited by their sense of smell. So children that are blind or anosmic, they can't smell, um, do quite well. They do quite well. So humans, they compensate. Yeah, humans are uh, incredibly resilient, and, and Yasa can uh, attest to this from his clinical experience. Um, Humans are uh, have a have a great brain for um, for repair. You want to address that? Um, yeah, we focus on trauma. There's you know, an increase in focus on resilience. Yes, humans are very resilient, <laughs> and uh, there is you know, an increase of interest in resilience. And uh, again, the majority of uh, when you look at the occurrence of trauma, even like severe traumas and combat trauma. Uh, we know that, uh, let's say, around 25 to 30 percent of returning veterans from Iraq will, will have symptoms of PTSD. But there are many of, much more, that they were exposed to trauma, but they never developed PTSD. And the similar things with, with, with children. Children are very resilient in general, but there are some that are more sensitive. So may I, I think I'll take a question as, that, as well. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I may have gotten it wrong, and I'm not versed in the literature, you said that if you uh, observe uh, Holocaust survivors, uh, second generation or maybe third generation, mm -hmm. then you see these behavioral and pathological mm -hmm. uh, conditions. Are there neurochemical or physical manifestation or changes that are also transmitted? Because in that case, you might ex expect it to be transmitted mm -hmm. further. Well, we don't. Um, well, first of all, the Holocaust studies, they, um, we, see, um, uh, we see these effects of Holocaust probably in the uh, second generation uh, in people who are kind of more anxious. So there, there are a lot of people who are resilient there too. If, there's any, if there are any chemical signatures, so we know that uh, um, the second generation, these are Rachel Lehuda studies, they have lower baseline cortisol levels. So again, cortisol is very important for stress. And if, if there's an excess of cortisol, it may have like a very um, a bad impact on our brain and our behavior and our general health. But uh, um, children of traumatized mothers have lower cortisol levels. Uh, so which means that they also, um, their response to stress is impaired. Because higher level of cortisols are bad. But increase of cortisol in a stressful situation is actually good. Cortisol, cortisol is protective on a, on a short run. So these are, these are things that we know kind of for sure. Um, but uh, what else is kind of a characteristic we, we do not know. Thank you. Do you have any other questions, comments? Yeah, Professor Rybakovsky. Uh, I just add something. Uh, what do you already said that according to the experiences of Joseph Zohar and, and his group, uh, the best preventive uh, procedure after uh, post-traumatic stress experience, experience within the several hours is just hydrocortisone injection. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your comment. Okay. Hello, I uh, have a question for either one of you. I was wondering about the relationship between your work and the work with humans on different kinds of attachment, secure attachment, ambivalent, avoidant attachment, and so on. It seems resonant, but I wanted you to, to comment on that. So there is a uh, test typically used on uh, human children, historically a very important test in terms of attachment, where the mother comes in and out of the room, a stranger comes into the room, and, and quite frankly, it's a stressor. Uh, so the main purpose of this uh, changing social situation is to stress the child. And based on the child's response to stress, they have categorized whether a child is a securely attached or insecure or uh, there are a number of categories. I think one a newer category these days is disordered attachment. And these are children from uh, abusive parents, drug addicts, and uh, very bad situations. Um, these mothers are um, incredibly 
unpredictable when they're interacting with their child. They will, um, you know, the child will have a need and the child will have, and the mother will have a very bad facial expression and, and not respond to the child needs as well as being abusive. So, um, so anyway, this disordered attachment seems to be related to later life incidents of uh, psychiatric disorders. Um, I think some people would argue with that, like Danny. Um, so it's not a wonderful, clear uh, assessment. One would argue that the test is limited, that it's good at identifying children, but our assessment of what <coughs> makes the attachment. So it's, it's, it's a very limited assessment of attachment. Sure, I'd like to add one thing, because there, there is someone who recently joined your lab, who is a pediatrician and who studies interactions between yeah. Nina. So if I can, so Nina is, uh, she's a pediatrician who studies the interactions between mothers and their few months old uh, children. And she joined Regina's lab recently to you know, do parallel animal work. So in the um, um, uh, Bellevue Hospital, which is a New York City um, hospital, uh, uh, thing of like 10,000 uh, of people who go through Bellevue every day. At any particular moment in the emergency room at Bellevue, there are over 40 languages being spoken. So you kind of have an image of it's a, it's a, it's a New York in a nutshell. Uh, so what they are looking at, they are looking at the interaction between the mother and the child. They don't do much inst uh, uh, instructions. So they, the mother, the, the child, the six-month-old child, is seated in, in, in a chair and the mother is in front of the child, and there's a camera on, and then they record it. And they also check, uh, they, then they run some tests on mothers to look if there are any psychiatric symptoms, mothers. So you will see that some of the mothers, you know, the child will be, um, uh, uh, the mother will be respo responding to the child, the child is distressed, mother will be kind of comforting the child, the child is smiling, mother was smiling, so there's kind of a synchrony in the behavior, but there are some, there are some situations that, that there is kind of a lack of synchrony. The mother is not responding. Like a depressed mother would likely, uh, the child is trying to uh, communicate something to the mother, but the mother is kind of so depressed that she would kind of avoid eye contact or, or she will be kind of without any, uh, any emotions, uh, uh, an emotional expression, like tronic experiments, but also your work. Uh, is there consent before recording? Uh, pardon me? Uh, uh, the, um, the testing, psychiatric testing? Before. Are they just recording these people in the emergency room? No, 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 they, no, no, they, no, it's a separate room, it's a separate room. They come to the clinic for, like a, uh, for, for regular appointments or for, for like, uh, you know, the, 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 so the children have. have. They, uh, they, they do, they do. And so. So, so what is kind of really happening is that if you find that there is kind of a lack of synchrony in this uh, between the mother and an infant, or, it, or it's disturbed some, somehow, then if you look at these children at the age, like let's say when they are six months later, when they are one year old, uh, they have um, their emotion regulation is disturbed. Some of them may also develop some symptoms, psychiatric symptoms. So there is a really the uh, the interaction between the mother and the child, uh, or the quality of the, this interaction is uh, is a predictor of uh, how the child does uh, later in life. So that's okay. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, it is the time to finish this session, and now there is lunch break. Thank you for our lecture.